I'm one of the leaders here at the church, and we are going through the Apostles' Creed here at Emmanuel over the autumn term. And so if you're joining us at Shoreham or at Marina or Hove, we are looking today at the ascension of Jesus Christ. Last time I spoke, I talked about the importance of the resurrection, that, that uh, Jesus on Easter Sunday burst out of the tomb. The tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. Uh, the soldiers on guard were scattered. Uh, the disciples were overjoyed as they began to realize after a few encounters with the risen Christ that he had indeed physically been raised from the dead. And that was the testimony of the, the disciples to the city of Jerusalem a few weeks later and then to the whole country of Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, as this message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was proclaimed. Uh, but one of the things we often skip past, perhaps unintentionally, is the ascension. Uh, what took place a few weeks later, after a, a, a short time during which Jesus spent time deliberately teaching and training the disciples again and uh, explaining what had been going on to their slightly fried minds by this stage, uh, it's, it's described that he, he was actually taken up physically before their eyes. Uh, there was a specific point in time and space where the physical body of Jesus Christ literally levitated above the ground and into the sky, into the clouds, at which point the disciples, who were gormlessly looking up like this, uh, were approached by a couple of what we, we must expect to be angels, messengers from God, who said to them, why are you staring up into the heavens? Uh, Jesus will come back the same way that he's gone. Uh, now you wait for the Holy Spirit to come in Jerusalem, which they did. This, this is described clearly in Matthew's Gospel, in Luke's Gospel, and at the beginning of the book of Acts. It's one of the central teachings of Christianity. It's right there in the creed, so it gets into the greatest hits as far as the writers of the creed were concerned. And they were right to include it as one of the greatest hits, one of the great teachings of the Bible. Because when you read this Bible, you begin to see that ascension is right at the heart of what it means for there to be a God and for there to be people made in his image. Ascending and descending are big parts of, of the Christian faith and big parts of life if we stop and consider it. So I want us to look at this theme together today and try and understand why it's so important that there really is a man, a physical man, a human being that, who has ascended in a way we can't completely understand. I, I, Imagine he must have picked up speed when he went past the clouds or somehow was transported in a way that we can't understand because space is a little bigger than, 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 than you, know, you can't go 20, 30 miles an hour and get very far when it comes to space, even in, a, even in 2000 years. By now, he'd be about halfway to Mars. Uh, so, so we must understand this as speaking of something profound, even though it's very literally described. He definitely did go up, but it speaks of something about going up that we need to learn from and understand. So I'm going to try and take us there, take us through this key teaching of the Bible, the man who ascended and who right now, physically, the man, Jesus, who sits, as, as the creed says, at the right hand of God the Father. He's literally in a place. There is literally a physical man. Jesus, the man, is seated somewhere <laughs> in the universe. This is, this is something we have to come to terms with and understand. We mustn't, we mustn't so spiritualize this that we, we don't allow for the physicality of it. There is a man called Jesus on the throne of the universe at the right hand of God the Father. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the creed states. And that's what we're going to investigate in our time. So let's, without further ado, look at an Old Testament passage of the Bible, which may surprise some of you, uh, but this is why I want you to, 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 to see today. I want, I want you to see that the whole of the Bible speaks about Jesus. The whole of the Bible even speaks about such things as his ascension. And one of the places it does that is in the Psalms, the great poetry book, the great hymn book of the Bible. 
And so one of the Psalms written by David, probably about a thousand years before Jesus was even born as a baby, this speaks, I think, of his ascension. This says this in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for your powerful help so that these words of Scripture might be applied to our hearts and our lives by the Spirit so that we can see the glory of your risen, exalted reigning Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be changed by the vision of him. Amen. So we, we do talk, perhaps without realising it, quite often about ascending and descending, about up and down. And uh, in our, in our post-Christian age where people have generally tried to dismiss the idea of an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-involved God uh, and dismiss the idea of a heaven to aspire to and a hell to avoid, we still tend to think in terms of up and down as, as I guess, good and bad. You know, we, we, we talk about things looking up or something being a, a downer uh, as, 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 as negative you know if somebody says you know I'm, I'm feeling yeah I'm feeling kind of uppish they don't say it with a with a frown if they say oh I'm feeling really down they're not they're not smiling about it generally uh, we we aspire to ascend <laughs> on a kind of I guess emotional level at least uh, we aspire to to be lifted up we, we 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 see that as good and we see descending as the thing to avoid, <clears throat> and even to the point where trying to uh, exceed our own uh, uh, previous success and achieve our full potential as individual human beings, we kind of will tend to see that as getting to the top of a mountain or a pyramid or a triangle. There's even the the psychologist uh, Abraham Maslow, who's fairly well-known hierarchy of human needs, uh, has definitely, his ideas have definitely got right into the way that we think as a city. So we, we in Brighton here, we might not be able to quote Maslow, but we think Maslow. We, we, we kind of instinctively, without realizing we're doing it, we want to pursue a certain pinnacle of a triangle where there's no God necessarily. It's not like we're trying to achieve some external kind of standard that's been put on us. We, we don't like that. We don't like the idea of being told what to do or being measured against a standard, against laws and commandments and holiness purity that's 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 not so attractive to contemporary people and we we we're, we're far more interested in our own judgment our own uh actualization as maslow called it achieving everything that we're meant to do getting to the top of our own mountain what what a what is the pinnacle of my fulfillment and that's that's definitely there you get it in everything from from the cheesy bits in us sitcoms to fitness videos to, to, uh, to just hip-hop music and, and R&B. It's all over the place, just that, that kind of mentality. 
And I suppose it speaks of a tendency, even when we've got rid of the, the big measuring stick that God brings into the, the picture, you should do this, thou shalt do this, and don't do this. We can't, in the end, even if we get rid of him, avoid the tendency to, to want some kind of judgment, want some kind of ideal. You may have seen, some of you, the, the, the interview that Russell Brand did with uh, Jordan Peterson earlier this year, um, which was an interesting discussion between these two, these two opinionated people, at w- one point of which there was a discussion about Jesus, and Jordan Peterson was referring to the Jesus of the Bible as uh, sometimes described in, as a judge. <laughs> as a judge. And Russell Brand reacted a little bit to this, saying, no, no, no one wants a judgmental Jesus. We don't want a judgmental Jesus. I guess that the image of Jesus as love, compassion, kindness, and nothing else is much more preferred by our culture. And he said, no, we don't want a judgmental Jesus. And Jordan Peterson came back at him with the words, you don't have a choice. If Jesus is your ideal, then he's also your judge. Not, Not just Jesus, if anything is your ideal. If you value and idealize anything, then it will judge you. You are judged by it. We set up ideals of what's good and what's bad, what's, even if it's just down to what's hot and what's not, what's in and what's out, who's scoring high, who's scoring low, you know, from everything, from, from you know, Sunday, Sunday newspaper magazine selections on, on the coolest and the, 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 the least cool, right through to strictly, you know, judging. Just we, we will find ways to judge uh, uh, all the time and, 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 and in terms of behaviours and achievements and attainments and results, we, we are constantly trying to get somewhere on a scale, even if it's just the scale in our own minds, it is a scale. And if we have an ideal that we're aspiring to, we are judging all the time. Can't ultimately be avoided. But here's the the question we should ask. What if there really what if there really is an up and a down that is the same for everybody? What if there really is a a height to attain to and a depth to avoid? What if there really are crash landings we could make that we shouldn't, we need to avoid? Imagine it like a, like an airline pilot. When you're on a plane you're being transported by someone who's been trained to not ultimately trust his or her own instincts about the altitude of the plane. They use what's called an altimeter. They, they, they have sophisticated technology, I hope, which, which basically is sets up with radar to, to get the exact altitude right and the, the pilot will put their trust in that more than they will in their instincts. Say if you're going through a storm or it's pitch black or something, the visibility is so poor, you can't really be sure how high, you can't completely know if you're not about to go cruising into a mountain. So you need instruments that give you exact readings. You need to be sure of your altitude. And you, you can't just go by, well, I feel like we're lifting. I feel like we're going, because you can be wrong. The teaching of the Bible is that we do get it wrong. We get it wrong a lot. We, we actually, we desire to go up, to ascend, but we don't necessarily know what ascension will look like. We don't know what's the best point of ascension. We don't know necessarily what is up and what's down. We can think that we're ascending when actually we're descending and vice versa. We can not feel attracted to ascending the right hill. We can, we can want to ascend the wrong hill. Even in your normal experience, you will have had the experience of pursuing a dream, wanting to achieve something and achieving it. You could, you could achieve that wonderful goal that you set yourself. Maybe over the year of 2018, you've set certain goals for yourself and you thought, if I could have this, I will be contented and fulfilled and happy. I'll be actualized, as Mazda would say. That would be it. If I just had this. And sometimes 
the worst thing that could happen to us, it seems, is for us to get what we longed for. Because we find out when we get there, it wasn't what I hoped for at all. It's like we've leaned our ladder against the wrong wall. We got right to the top. And it took ages, and it was death-defying and dangerous, and it was rickety, and I could have fallen any minute, but I got to the top, and then I looked, and I saw, it's the wrong wall. This isn't where I wanted to be. And the Bible wants us to see there is such a thing as a hill of the Lord. There is, there is a place to ascend to which is truly where we belong. I think instinctively we know this. This is what this verse is saying. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? And when we talk holy, and when we see that word in the Bible especially, we probably have pretty negative, if not just boring, kind of notions in our head. But that's where we need educating, because the Bible's never describing something uh, routine, uh, something uh, sort of unfulfilling and unsatisfying, quite the opposite. It's talking of something deeply satisfying, talking of something, something actually that we, we do have a word for. We would sometimes call it paradise. Paradise. We are described in the Bible as having been placed in Eden at the beginning. Humanity put in the garden, Eden, delight, the word means, a garden of delight. And interestingly, Eden is described subtly in ways that make us understand that it was uphill. <laughs> it was up. It's even referred to in the book of Ezekiel as, as a mountain, Mount Eden, if you like. It's, it's like a lifted up place. The rivers come from it, for goodness sake. It's, it's got to be uphill. Rivers don't come from valleys. They, they, rivers gush from uphill. They trickle down. And so, and so Eden is a lifted up place. And interestingly, when humanity fell, that's not just the idea that we fell away from God it's sort of inwardly, spiritually, but we fell away from God even physically, geographically. It means that we descended. We, we were banished from a garden and had to go down into the lower places. And when God shows up after that, when God introduces himself to the human race at various stages through this book, he very often does it from a high place, does it on a mountain. We could list all the examples. There are many. It seems like there's something about being, in, being introduced to God, encountering God, that, that, that God wants us to associate with being able to ascend again to a high place, to be with him. And it, again, interestingly, when the people of God were <clears throat> told to construct a kind of holy place, at first, it was just a tent, but it was a holy tent. And then later it was a building, the temple made from stone, in which the presence of the living God, Yahweh, was made known to people so that people could have fellowship, interaction, relationship with him in this tiny special unit, this place on planet Earth. The place where it was parked well, yeah, it was, it was a mountain, Mount Zion. It was a lifted up place. It was referred to as the Holy Hill. People that traveled there on pilgrimage, they ascended to the mountain. They ascended to Zion. Why? To be with God, to be in Zion, to be in the presence of God. That was the whole point. And so when David starts writing, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? It's full of all this kind of tradition. It's full of all this rich imagination that they had of Eden, of the presence of God, being brought back to him into relationship with this wonderful God for whom they were made. And we, each of us, cherish the idea of being brought to a place of delight, a place of inclusion, a place that's our home, don't we? All of us do. We we, we want to find the place where we'll feel accepted, where we'll feel known, where we'll feel loved. Why do people get on horrible little rafts, tiny little rafts, in their dozens and dozens, and literally risk their lives and lose their lives in many cases to get across the Mediterranean to reach southern Europe? Why are these images filling on our newspapers over the last few years? Why, why is this happening? Because people want to find a home. 
and be driven to terrible extremity, terrible risk. And it, it, it's not just because, well, they're looking for a cheap option just to try and make a buck, just to try and... In, 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 I'm sure the vast majority of cases, these are people who never would have dreamed of leaving the place of their upbringing. They only do it because they're, they're, their actual home has become interminable. They can't possibly stand it. They've got to get out. The risks they'll take to do it, the death-defying and sometimes the death-encountering decision that they take shows that within the human heart there's this drive to find a place of safety, a place of, of health, a place of acceptance, a place of delight, a place of destiny, a place of purpose, a place of employment, a place where I can do something with my life and be useful, a place where I can get to succeed and, and have some dreams fulfilled. It's in us, each one. We, we want this and long for it. We'll pursue it. We want to pursue this place of belonging. We want to ascend somehow. And when the Bible talks about standing in his, ho- in his presence and ascending his hill, we need to get away from twisted and dull religious notions that, that, that aren't attractive and aren't inspiring and understand that no, this is intended to appeal to the human heart as it is, that is intended to appeal to genuine human identity, longing that we, we sometimes are barely even aware of, but that only God, only God himself and the presence of God can truly fulfill. But we've got a problem, a, a huge problem, and that is that when you look at these qualifications, because it starts as a question in verse 3, who should ascend the hill? And then the answer comes, Verse 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, who does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, if you, if you read that and think, okay, I get it. I'll tick those things off. I'll, I'll achieve those by next week. I'll, yeah, I'll get that in the back. I'll, I've got it. I, I can get that done. I can get that down. Then you haven't understood it. You're being glib. Because there's nothing easy about that. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. According to what the Bible means by a pure heart, well, I'm disqualified for a start. Let's put it that way. And I'm the preacher. I'm the one with a book in his hand. I'm, I'm standing here telling you, I know that I don't have a pure heart. I know I don't. I know myself too well. I think of just the last few hours and I know I'm, I'm out already. How about you? If you understand what a pure heart is according to the Bible, you'll, you'll not be encouraged by that verse. And if you start thinking, okay, that, that inspires me to try harder, then you are destined for deep discouragement. Because there's, there's no way around this. Is, this is putting before us something that is, it's, it's hard to jump this hoop. But not only is it hard to jump this hoop, those who try usually end up worse than they were or at least they become less happy than they were. That's why religious people are often defensive, critical, judgmental, for sure. There's a sense in which we can can feel like, well, I'm not doing very well, I'm not ascending the hill very well, but at least I'm higher than they are. I haven't achieved the altitude I want, but I'm definitely beating him, I'm beating her. And because of that, we, we feel like we've arrived. But actually, in reality, if we understood what was going on in our heart at that point, we're proud, we're arrogant, we're self-righteous, we're self-confident. These are not good things. These are things that the Bible has. Jesus came along speaking thunderingly against. When Jesus came into the world, his criticisms were so often against those who were basically religious, who were trying to ascend the holy hill, trying to stand in the holy place by their their approach, their, their own purity of heart, their own cleanliness of hands. And Jesus had to say to me, you're not clean. You're, maybe you're clean on the outside, but your hearts are filthy. Your, your, your heart, it's like you're a, your little cups that are looking really nice and dainty and clean, nice china cups, clean on the outside, but inside dregs and poison. And the best that religion can do really is, is create an outward appearance of righteousness that can look quite good sometimes and people can be impressed with us, but our hearts can remain cold to God, cold to others, and colder and colder and colder. So we're not ascending really 
And when we get to realize how we're not making progress, it leads to despair and discouragement. So the question remains, who can ascend? Who can ascend? It's interesting that the Bible does give a kind of an answer early on in the sense that there are certain individuals who are very rarely at special points permitted to ascend. They, they're referred to as priests. And there's a whole chunk of the Bible, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, that describe in detail the circumstances under which these priests are permitted to ascend into the holiest place. Literally, in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's that word, ascend, into the holy place. There are certain people who got that permission. They got that liberty to go in. It was after all kinds of ritual cleansing. It was after special uh, uh, consecration for the task. They were carefully selected people. They could only be from one of the tribes. They could only have certain you know, family background. They, they, everything about them was very, very sort of uh, filtered down to a very kind of select level. And yet they were given this phenomenal provision of standing in the presence of God. They could only stand, mind you. They never got to sit. They were always standing. Why? Because they were busy. The only way they could get into the presence of God was through sacrifice, was through the giving of blood, animals in their case, blood that was offered. And they could come into the presence of God, but they would have to apply the blood. They'd have to go through. It was like watching a, you know, I guess if you were there, no one got to be there with them. But if you were there, you'd see someone busy. You'd see someone applying blood. Like like running a process carefully, operating it carefully, making sure it goes well, and then being free to leave. You didn't sit down. You just stood all the way through. You stood, you stood, you stood in the holy place. And this, this idea of priesthood meant that there is at least provision for some. There's some of humanity that gets to be in the... Pre- Humans can, under certain circumstances, it seems, press into the presence of God. But the Bible goes on to say that this provision in itself didn't really work. It wasn't really the answer itself. It was a sign. It was a picture of, of a greater answer. It was describing an answer that was to come. The, the writer to the Hebrews, so in the New Testament, you get this ph- phenomenal book called Hebrews, where someone tries to describe all this stuff I'm telling you. And this is, this is the words of the Bible as they explain this. It says this, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, like tents and temples, which are copies of, of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, standing up, applying the blood, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. You see, what would happen with the priest is he would go into this holiest place, what was called the Holy of Holies. The tabernacle itself, the tent, was cut into two parts. It was like it was a, and like it says, it was a copy of, of the reality. This division that goes through creation, if you like, between the presence of God and those who are outside the presence of God was symbolized by a a kind of curtain that went through the tabernacle. It's actually a curtain that went through the temple as well, a huge, big, fat curtain. And it it was symbolizing the, the ultimate division in the universe between God the Father in heaven and us on earth. And 
the person, this priest, this individual who went into the holy place, went beyond the curtain that could go right in there, would be waited for. Let's wait. Let's see what happens when he, he comes out. Will he come out? Will he be safe? What will happen to him? And the writer to the Hebrews is saying, Jesus, as our priest, he has gone through the curtain. He has ascended to the heavenly place. He has ascended to the place that the priest's activity in the tabernacle and the temple was just a sign of. Jesus is the real priest. And he's really gone to the heavens. He's really gone there as the priest. He really has ascended. He really is the man of Psalm 24. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, who does not swear deceitfully, he has received blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Jesus is the great victorious man, the heroic, holy, righteous man who was pure of heart. And God the Father is pleased with him and says, you can receive righteousness and salvation. You have won, you've conquered, you've been victorious. And not only that, but it says about Jesus, he can sit down. <laughs> Jesus is the one who sat down. Even as we say in the creed, he has ascended into heaven and sat down. The priests would never get to in the old covenant. In the old system, they never get sat down. The, the work was never finished. The sin was always there. The failures would keep coming. Every time they come out of the tabernacle, there was still more sin being stored up by the people of Israel. Still more sin to be atoned for. And we feel like that, don't we, so often? I try harder, I try harder, I do quite well, but then I sin again, I blow it again, I fail again, I have to say sorry again. And so we might even imagine ourselves as priests having to sort of go in and just placate God and say, so God, if only, if only I, I would do a little bit better. Like one day I'll improve. One day you won't have to forgive me anymore. Maybe we imagine ourselves as the, the, the mediators, the priests, the ones who the, ascend the holy hill by our own purity of heart. Not that we'll ever reach it by our own strength. We know we won't. But there's one who's pure of heart, clean of hands, who's never lifted up his soul to all his force, who is perfect in his righteousness. And he, is, he has offered sacrifice once and for all and sat down. He's done a complete and finished work. And here's the thing, he's done it on our behalf. Jesus has gone in to that holy place. It's fascinating to me that it describes when Jesus ascended before the disciples, it literally describes clouds. Why does it go on about the clouds? He went into the clouds. Who cares? Well, of course he is going into the sky. Maybe, you know, okay, it was a cloudy day. It's not always cloudy in Israel. Why, why is it describing? I think it's because of the, the priests. The priests would go into the holiest place of all, which was a place where the presence of God dwelt, a cloud of glory. Jesus is the true priest. He's going into the clouds of the presence of God. He's going in there. But my friend, he's not just going there on his own behalf. He's going there on ours. He's going there on ours. He's not just oh, lucky, so pleased that one of us got through. <laughs> who should ascend the hill of the Lord? Who? Who could possibly do it? Who could, who could pull the sword from the stone? <laughs> Which hero is there? Who could, who could survive the curse of Voldemort? Which hero? Who could be Harry? Who could be King Arthur? Oh, there's a hero. There's someone who did it. Well done, you. There's one hero we can write about. The whole point of the priest is the priest went in as the whole people of God. That's, that's what the priest was. The priest was the representative the priest carried the people. That's why they waited outside. They waited for him to appear. Because when he appears, we, we all know <laughs> we're, we're rescued with him. There would be this celebration as he would come out of the tabernacle. There would be this massive roar of approval. He's our man. He's our rep. And he's won. He's, he's, succeed. he's, he's been before the, holy, the holiest place of all. And he's got for us what we need. Jesus when he ascended, he went to be with the Father to, to do what? To sit back, to kick his feet up. Jesus went to represent us. 
Jesus went, actually, Jesus went to serve us in a way that we could never have been served by him if he'd stayed on planet Earth, located in only one position. Now, to be sure, there's mystery here. Jesus is a man and God. Jesus as the man, Christ Jesus, <laughs> physically one man, is located in one place for sure. His body is located in one place. But he's, he is God and man. And in a way we can't completely understand, as God and man, he is everywhere. And actually, we can understand it to some extent because by ascending to the throne, he gets to send the powerful third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to be amongst us, who is the agent of his presence in the world today. We'll get to him in a few weeks when we talk about, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But what it means for one thing, friends, is that by ascending, he is more with us than he could ever have been. That's why he said this strange thing to Mary in the garden. You may remember on Easter Sunday when she, she reaches out and touches him when he's in the garden and he says, Mary, don't cling on to me. I've not yet ascended to be with the Father. I often thought, why, why does he say that? Strange thing to say. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Is he kind of being all peculiar and mysterious? You know, he mustn't touch me. Or is he scared that she's going to notice that he's actually just a ghost? You know, don't touch me. No, 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 no. He, he, he's, she could touch him. You know, he, he could eat fish. He could do all the rest. They, he told him to touch his hands. He, he wasn't against being touched in the sense, in that sense. He was saying, "Don't cling to me." Why? What's the problem? He's saying, "Listen, if you cling to me, it's you saying, don't go. If you go, I've lost you." That's where Mary was coming from. I lost you at the cross. I don't want to lose you again. Don't go, don't go. Jesus is saying, don't cling to me, Mary. I'm going to my Father. The Bible says that as he ascends to be with the Father, he ascends to a place where he fills all things. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about this. He's ascended that he might fill all things. <laughs> he's, he's powerfully present with his people. Not just in one place, everywhere. He's, he's with you like he was with them in the stories. See, I often think, wouldn't it be lovely to be there when Jesus fed the 5,000, for example? <laughs> what, wouldn't it be fantastic to have just seen it, just been there when he did that for them? But that's just bad theology. Because that was nothing compared to what he's doing now. That was just a few people on a hillside in Galilee, just a few thousand people. Now he's feeding billions all around the world every day, feeding them with spiritual food, blessing them, looking after them, and physical food, everything we need. How? It's provided by Jesus. It's provided by our Savior. He's caring for us. He's looking after us. He's meeting our needs. We can be sure, just as sure as they were on that hillside that day with full tummies, with fish and bread, and 12 baskets left over, looking at that and saying, look at the sunset, the day's coming to an end. This has been an amazing day because Jesus has been with us. We'll never forget this day. This was the best day. This is a one-off. There's never going to be a day like this. Wrong. For the Christian, every day is like that. Every day is a day where our Jesus, the exalted head who's ascended over all things, is providing for us. He's meeting our needs. He's caring for us. He's doing it because he cannot not do it. He's that devoted and committed to us. He's ruling over all things, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, for the sake of his body that is the church. That's what he has in mind. He's ruling over everything for the sake of his body, the church. How, how did he get into power? God raised him up, put him in power. And now while he's in power, <laughs> he's ruling everything on our behalf. It's so easy for us to get cynical about politicians who make promises before they get into power. Vote me in and I will do this for you. Vote me in and I will do that for you. And then we watch them in the first few days, few weeks, 100 days as they often call it. The first 100 days, let's see how many of the manifesto promises get fulfilled. Let's see what you actually do. Let's see if you keep any of the promises you made on campaign trail. You said you would do this for the NHS, for hospitals, for, for, for schools. You, you said you'd do this for the penal system. You said you'd do this. You said your taxes would change. You said everything. What have you actually done? 
It's so easy for us to get so jaded by the, the cheap promises of man. But this man, this man is different. He said, I'm, I'm going to prepare a home for you. Really? Has he ever lied? Jesus is the one who's gone into power on our behalf. He's gone not to Westminster. He's gone to the HQ of the universe with you in mind. With you in mind. And it's not just that he's doing it because I've got to keep my word or they might vote me out. Paul says in Ephesians 5, he cares for the church as his own body. As his own. He can't not care for you because you're joined with him. He, in a sense, doesn't have a choice. <laughs> not that he'd want to choose otherwise. It's in his heart. But what I'm saying is he's that bound to you. He's there for you. He's there as you. He's there with you in mind. You complete him, you could say. Jesus is there thinking of you, praying for you. He ever lives to make intercession for you. The priests would go into the tabernacle with 12 stones on their chest. 12 stones. And the stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Because the priest was there not on his own behalf. He was there for the people. He was there as the people. He was, he was there representing. They were there, symbolically at least, with him. And actually, the New Testament says that Jesus, our priest, he's there and we're there not just symbolically. We actually are there with him. Colossians chapter 3, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden. You're raised up and seated in heavenly places with him. Am I? I thought I was in Shoreham or, or the Marina or, or Hove. I th I'm not seated. In if you're in Christ, you really are in Christ. You really are seated in the man that was raised. You, the human, fallen in Adam, failed, never able to ascend the hill of the Lord. Someone has ascended for you and you have ascended in him. And he pleads for you. He prays for you. He has prayer lists. But his prayer lists are not like mine. That I forget, I put people on it and I forget to get to them. And I say to people, yeah, I'll pray for that. And then I forget and I feel guilty and say, oh, Lord Jesus, please bless him. You know, as I'm, as I'm running from one place to another. I, I, I'm finite in my praying. I can't keep up with my prayer commitments. And I've only got about 20 or 30 people on my prayer list. Jesus has got billions on his prayer list. How does he do it? He's God. He can pray for you earnestly, passionately to his Father, as he's been doing in all eternity, in perfect communion. Yeah, he's man. He's only got one mouth. I don't know how he does it. Don't ask me. It's, there's science in this that I'm not able to get close to. Maybe some of you are. But whatever we say about it, we know that he ever lives to make intercession for his own, his own, his beloved, his bride to whom he's been joined forever and ever and ever. This surely changes everything. This surely gives us courage and confidence and strength. It surely helps us. <laughs> I had the privilege just last week, and I'll finish with this, of meeting some, some brothers and sisters from China who, who helped lead the underground churches in China. And uh, remarkable people, humble, faithful people, serving Jesus in very difficult circumstances. They're describing some of the things they face. And they described a situation where the education department had tried to set up a scheme where they would get students to sign forms saying they reject Christianity. Imagine, imagine this. Imagine this happening to Christian children. They've got to sign a thing, I reject Christianity. And many of them did, under pressure. Many children just said, yeah, okay, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Christian, because they felt frightened. And they got it down to one little girl. And she said, I, I, I can't. I can't sign it. Just can't. I asked later, what happened to this girl? And the good news is that she's safe. She, she, the, there was enough outcry on her behalf for the, the authorities to be careful in how they dealt with her. But what helps a little girl in China 
stay faithful under such circumstances. How does she do that? Is she, is she able by her own strength to ascend the hill of the Lord? Is that because she's such a heroic, courageous little one on her own? Where does she find the courage? Where does she find the devotion? How can she say that? Her words were, I cannot deny him. I cannot deny him. What does that mean? It means that she knows him. She loves him. She understands what he's done for her. She knows that he's committed to her. She knows that he's praying on her behalf. What she knows of him and who he is and what he's done for her has changed her perspective on the worst trial of her life. My friend, you must understand what Jesus is doing for you now. You must know him through that lens. See the world through that lens. My Jesus is for me and he's praying for me. And he doesn't get his prayers denied. He's my saviour today, not just on the cross, but today. He's my priest, he's ascended, and he's ascended for me. We'll just pray now. Father, we ask you to help us to stand in the good of this wonderful truth. In Jesus' name, amen.